Hello, everyone, and welcome to, to today's Decision Making Voices from the Field Leadership Seminar. My name is Grayson Armstrong, and I'm a Master's of Public Health student here at the School of Public Health in the Department of Healthcare Management and Policy. Today, we are honored to have Dr. Jonathan Woodson joining us. Dr. Woodson currently serves as the United States Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, where he acts as the Principal Advisor to the Secretary of Defense on Health Issues. Among his many responsibilities, Dr. Woodson co-chairs the Armed Services Biomedical Research Evaluation and Management Committee, which provides oversight of the Department of Defense's biomedical research. He also serves as administrator of the Military Health System Budget, consisting of $50 billion and comprising 133,000 military and civilian medical personnel, researchers, and health administrators operating in an unparalleled integrated healthcare delivery system. Dr. Woodson holds the rank of Brigadier General in the U.S. Army Reserve and has served our nation overseas in Operation Desert Storm, Kosovo, Operation Enduring Freedom, and Operation Iraqi Freedom. For his dedicated and illustrious service to our country, he has been awarded the Legion of Merit, the Bronze Star Medal, and the Meritorious Service Medal with Oak Leaf Clusters. Prior to his current appointment by President Obama, Dr. Woodson served as a practicing vascular surgeon, as well as both the Assistant Dean of Diversity and Multicultural Affairs and Professor of Surgery at Boston University's School of Medicine. During that time, Dr. Woodson was named one of the top vascular surgeons in Boston and one of the top surgeons in the United States. A graduate of City College of New York and of the New York University School of Medicine, Dr. Woodson received his postgraduate medical education here at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Before I turn the session over to Dr. Ashish Jha, who will be moderating our panel today, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jonathan Woodson to the Harvard School of Public Health and the Decision Making Voices from the Field Leadership Seminar Series. Dr. Woodson, Dr. Woodson, let me also say thank you so much for being here this afternoon. The pleasure really is all mine. So I'm going to start off by just making a couple of quick comments and, and, and turn it over to you for reactions. And I think we will speak uh, for about 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll open it up to the, to the students and everybody else in the audience. So if you think about Dr. Woodson's roles and responsibilities, he is essentially the chief executive of one of the largest healthcare systems in the US. But there are some very distinctly important differences between his responsibilities, really the responsibilities of the military health system, and any other healthcare delivery system. Um, they have to be able, on a moment's notice, to set up healthcare infrastructure anywhere in the world at any moment. Right? The CEO of Kaiser does not have to worry about this. Um, they are a public entity that is focused on taking care of a very special group of people, people who are committing their lives to defending the country. And that means taking care of everything from chronic diseases like diabetes and heart disease to managing malaria for people who are in, in, in harm's way in, in, in developing countries. It's an enormously complex set of responsibilities um, and one where I think that there are substantial challenges ahead as we think about the military health system going forward. And so what I was hoping was maybe if you could just start off talking about what you think are the, the challenges in the next three to five years for the military health system or, or, or longer time frame. And how in your role as, as the leader of this system, you have begun to address them. Uh, I think that might be a good place for us to just get started. Well, thank you for that question. And uh, first of all, let me just say what a really pleasure it is to be here at the School of Public Health and engage with uh, so many young and bright faces. I'm, I'm a little bit intimidated because I know later on I'm going to get some really tough questions, but that, that's OK. Uh, uh, that really is OK. I also want to thank uh, 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 the student who introduced me because uh, that was a very kind introduction, uh, probably uh, far, far too kind, uh, but probably makes you want to think, uh, what the heck was he thinking at during the course of his career? I mean, he probably couldn't decide on what he really wanted to do. Um, uh, but it brings you to a position, uh, you know, I think it was Churchill who said that uh, 
at some point in uh, a man or woman's life, uh, they get a tap on the shoulder, um, and uh, it uh, really, I'm paraphrasing now, it becomes a shame if they're unprepared uh, to assume the responsibilities of the time. Um, and lead whatever effort um, uh, is necessary. And uh, that is pretty much uh, the way I look at uh, how I came to this position. Uh, uh, it wasn't by design or plan, uh, but it was uh, a fact that, uh, um, for better or worse, I was building my toolkit but throughout my uh, career with two parallel kinds of interests, one in academic surgery and the other in the military and there was a great deal of overlap that allowed me some success in uh, one or the other field. So I was borrowing uh, leadership development and this diverse set of experiences I had in the military and applying it to my civilian practice and then the analytic academic approach uh, helped me I think succeed in, uh, in the military. But uh, that brings us to the point of your question, which is now uh, we understand there are challenges. There are challenges in healthcare uh, writ large, and um, the military health system is uh, but a microcosm of that. Um, so in the military health system, first of all, let me lay out what it, what it really means, because uh, everyone may not be familiar with that. Uh, the military health, st health system is really a, um, a complex, uh, broad spectrum, uh, really health system. Uh, we have uh, 56 hospitals, nearly 700 clinics, uh, we're worldwide distributed, uh, 130,000 sort of core personnel, but uh, uh, thousands of other extended personnel. We have a medical education system, we have a medical school, a um, uh, uniformed services university, which not only produces doctors, but advanced degree nurses, uh, public health folks, uh, and um, uh, uh, basic science degree uh, folks as well. We have uh, veterinary um, uh, uh, schools uh, or uh, training um, uh, services and delivery services uh, because when we go uh, to uh, foreign countries, we have to certify food for our troops and make sure that they uh, remain healthy. Our fundamental historical foundation has been one of public health. Uh, so if you think about Walter Reed and what uh, he did uh, in yellow fever, you talked about malaria, it's been predominantly about uh, uh, protecting uh, the deployed troops uh, historically and that's been our foundation uh, in terms of, uh, of care. We have a huge uh, research and development uh, portfolio uh, that is uh, very broad in spectrum and I won't go into that. But the reason I'm mentioning that is, uh, in getting to uh, answering your question, is that um, uh, the, chal the challenges are out there and we'll talk about the challenges of cost and changing medical care um, that everyone has to deal with. But we uh, luckily control all of the variables. Uh, and so uh, one of the pleasures of my job, um, uh, although there are real challenges, is that I get to, uh, with my uh, enormously talented uh, staff and group of individuals I work with, uh, uh, begin to have the opportunity to manipulate these variables to try and drive an optimum outcome. Uh, and, and again, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second, but I do want to make sure I make mention of the how proud I am of the enormously talented people I work with uh, in uniform and the civilian component uh, as well. But to get to the core of your question, um, uh, clearly uh, we are in interesting times. Um, uh, in the history of this country, in the history of medicine, in the history of uh, military medicine. As it relates uh, to this country, of course, uh, we are grappling with uh, huge issues. Uh, um, from the political divide to the fiscal budgetary issues and what we should, how we should set priorities in the future. In the military, uh, we've been at war uh, for over a decade and in fact um, in October we began our 13th year of continuous combat operations in Afghanistan, unprecedented. Uh, if you read history and you know about the long wars, we are in that period of long war. Who would have thought that day after 9-11, 13 years later, we would be uh, still embroiled in combat operations. Uh, uh, and then we're in an, an interesting period in military medicine uh, because medicine has changed so much and continues to change. Uh, um, we know um, that uh, it requires a lot more specialization, technology, 
there's a lot more cost, uh, the way we deliver care, uh, we need to optimize, and all of those factors affect the, the military health system. So as I moved into this job, um, we were dealing with all of those uh, respective uh, uh, challenges. We were moving into a post-war uh, period of time. Uh, the President's committed to being out of Afghanistan in terms of combat operations by the end of 2014, which is really around the, around the corner. And if, after every period of war in history, uh, there has been a reevaluation of the need for military forces and a reduction in budget. Um, and when you get that colliding with a national debt problem, there is increased focus on how to make the Department of Defense uh, uh, much more efficient. And by extension, of course, how to make the military health system uh, much more efficient. And so th that was my challenge. But I want to lay out for you, um, uh, before we talk about more specific issues, the dynamic process, the dynamic set of conditions that we operate in. Uh, a number of years ago, when I was spending time at the U.S. Army War College, uh, where I got a degree in uh, strategic studies uh, and strategic leadership, uh, one of the concepts I was interested, uh, introduced uh, to and became fascinated by was the fact that strategic leaders had to operate in what we call the VUCA world. VUCA is an acronym for Volatile, Uncertain, Complex, and Ambiguous. Now, you throw those words together <laughs> and you say, what? Uh, you know, uh, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. <coughs> volatile uh, you know, represents what we do in the military. And, and the, the, the concept at the War College was that strategic leaders and senior leaders had to feel comfortable operating in the VUCA world. Uh, war, by its very nature, is volatile. Um, it's uncertain because every time you develop a battle plan, the enemy is going to change that battle plan after the first encounter. It's complex because you're talking about everything from arms to terrain to culture to political objectives, uh, and it's ambiguous because many times these things are rapidly changing and you get the fog of war, if you will, uh, and it's hard to, cert, uh, to sort things out. But what, what was impressed upon me is that strategic leaders uh, have got to bring that clarity to the VUCA world. They've got to see beyond the fog. They've got to define the vision. They've got to define the end state. Now, if you're a good strategic leader, you def help define that end state and you clearly communicate it, but you don't tell your talented crew how to get there. You empower them, enable them to use every bit of their ingenuity, every bit of their intellect, every bit of their talent to design the tactical approach to getting to that end state, uh, that vision, that optimal state of, uh, of, of, of being or operating. So I was turned on and challenged uh, and introduced to that term and I've used it constantly over the years uh, because uh, as you evolve as a leader um, and become a strategic leader, you have got to be comfortable uh, being uncomfortable. Living in um, that world of challenge, in that world of um, sort of cloudy, murky, where a lot of factors come together, a lot of variables come together, and sorting things out. Now, I want to lay out, to begin with, before I go back to the military health system, another concept uh, that sort of has guided me. Uh, in, in, in trying to work in this uh, VUCA world, which is the old saying is, how do you eat the elephant? One bite at a time, right? Uh, and the issue here is that when you've got a large, complex problem, you don't get frustrated by it. In fact, that's a word that I've eliminated from my personal vocabulary when I talk about problems. And when I mentor uh, my other senior staff and uh, leaders, I I ask them to consciously think about eliminating that, that term. Because what it does is, number one, it conveys to your subordinates a sense that you haven't got control of the situation and you haven't got an answer. But if you get back to the statement of how do you eat the elephant uh, one bite at a time, 
Your job as a strategic leader is to lay out the series of facts and variables and then approach each one with incremental solutions. So it may be political issues as well as technical issues, but if you lay them out uh, in sort of their smallest elements, there almost surely is an answer to each one of those issues that you've got to deal with. And then it's your job to just sequence them so that you can leverage them to get to the end state and get to the clarity and get to the answer that you need. So you've got to understand the VUCA world. You've got to be comfortable in the VUCA world. You've got to learn how to eat the elephant. Uh, and that gets us back to um, uh, your original question. So I walked in, um, oh, well, you say, how do I get here? Well, uh, it goes back to that Churchill issue about being tapped on the shoulder. I never expected to be in this job, but one day I, I get this page uh, to call the White House. And I say, what, you know, what's, this all, what's this all about? Um, uh, you know, I thought it was a joke, um, to tell you the truth. Um, but one thing led to another, and um, my name had gotten on a list. Um, to be considered for this job and another and another job, another senior job. And I think the reason it got on the list uh, was, um, as Churchill alluded to, um, is that uh, sometimes you're tapped on the shoulder because people think you've got the right set of tools for the time, basically. So I had been in the military, I had uh, ascended the, the command, I had been deployed, um, I had commanded uh, uh, brigades. Uh, I, at my current reserve job at the time was that I was the Assistant Surgeon General for uh, Force Structure Mobilization and Reserve Affairs. So I understood some of the nature. In fact, I had an office in Washington uh, and in the, in the Pentagon. Um, I had a, my second job was to be outside of the system, to bring that experience from outside of the system where I had been um, uh, growing up in, maturing in um, an academic environment, an analytical environment, uh, um, and to some extent um, uh, a very technical environment. And so I was tapped to do this job and came into a world where my job, what, what I do, is to be the single point uh, for what I call translation between national big priorities and technical concerns of how do you deliver health care and how do you maintain uh, an unparalleled supreme uh, medical uh, uh, set of institutions that will serve the defense of this nature, uh, serve the defense of this nation far into the 21st century. How do we make sure that we're better, stronger, ready and more relevant for the future um, and produce the kinds of reforms that we needed to. So it gets back to the issue of transformative time at the end of the period of war. We've got a budget crunch, uh, we've got changes in medicine and how we care for medicine, um, and we've got the challenges of uh, uh, what to do, how to provide uh, this enabling capability uh, to the military services. The problem can be um, capsulized in understanding um, just the current budget situation, if you, if you will, uh, uh, to sort of bring a concrete uh, set of challenges. Right now, I control about 10% uh, of the base budget of the Department of Defense. And I'm a must-pay bill. Healthcare is a must-pay bill. It ap actually represents, in some sense, an entitlement that is a must-pay bill. If I don't control my cost, I continue to grow. And the Congressional Budget Office, uh, right now I'm about $54 billion, right, of sort of base costs with another $6 billion, uh, what I call below the line. If I don't control my costs, by 2017 it was predicted that I would be $65 billion, and by 2030, $95 billion. At a time when the top line of the Department of Defense is declining, I now rise to be 12, 14, 15 percent of, of budget. When that happens, I compete with the rest of the military services to modernize the force, man the force, train the force, uh, and deploy the force. 
Ships don't sail, planes don't fly, and battalions don't move. Okay? That's a national defense issue. Okay? Uh, and I need to be able to produce reforms in a situation in which uh, everybody is wedded to their historical context of how they do business. And I'm asked to produce reforms in a context in which everybody above me, remember I'm the final translation uh, person, everybody above me has enormous concerns and health is a small part of what they do and how they see the world. So when I go in and talk to the Secretary of Defense, uh, he's got to worry about the guy in Korea who might want to start a war, the guy in Syria who he's got to deal with, the Afghanistan situation, and a hundred other fires that you will never know about that's on the intel brief on any given day. Okay? And the President, of course, much bigger uh, military health, rather small. They don't have time for the details. But the priorities are clear, all right? If I look below me, of course, I've got a great group force of people who are really focused on the technical details of delivering care and making advances. Our researchers, our doctors, our nurses, our medics, our, our health administrators. And my job is to make sure that I translate these priorities in a way that these folks don't feel demoralized by being supplanted by what they think are just budget cutters. How do I make the system better, stronger, ready, and more relevant uh, for the future? And so when you look at that, that becomes the VUCA world. That's the challenge. Uh, it's about making sure I understand stakeholders, uh, make sure I understand, I articulate a vision, uh, I motivate people, I inspire. Now, you know, I think it was uh, Harry Truman, uh, uh, actually, who uh, wasn't thought of as a great president at the time, but turns out probably to be one of the greater presidents uh, for the time, if you will. A guy, just like Churchill said, who was tapped on the shoulder uh, uh, and seemingly unprepared. Remember, he and Roosevelt didn't enjoy a great relationship. In fact, he had been excluded from much of uh, the decision making and then suddenly Roosevelt dies and he's president and he's got to take on all of these issues, uh, basically. But Harry Truman once said that, you know, uh, leadership is about getting a man, uh, read that also, woman, uh, to do things that they don't want to do and like it. <laughs> and like it right? Uh, and uh, that is really the job. It's about um, articulating a vision and making it resonate with all of the stakeholders in a way they understand to get them to subscribe, to motivate, to inspire them, to march toward those goals and to that vision, and then to like it. Not, not just to do it because Woodson says by some authoritative way that it must be done, but to embrace it as their own, to see it as relevant uh, to their future, uh, to in fact uh, want to be part of that transformation. And that, that really is the art of uh, uh, strategic leadership. I'll mention one other thing and then uh, give you an opportunity to uh, ask uh, some additional questions. So. Uh, Understanding the complexity of the situation, what do you do in terms of mapping out that vision? It's very clear that leaders need to be uh, clear and decisive uh, and articulate in the vision. So what I did is I mapped out uh, a vision for the military health system uh, that uh, really evolved along uh, six lines of effort. So it was pretty clear. First of all, I articulated a vision that modernized the administrative structure that produced a more joint environment. Historically, there had been really three separate services, uh, three separate systems, with some redundancies uh, because there was an Army, Navy, and Air Force uh, medical service. And there was an opportunity to produce some efficiency. So I articulated a joint um, uh, structure, uh, administrative structure, uh, 
that was going to be relevant to the future because it was going to be more efficient. And oh, by the way, the data from the last 12 years of war suggested that we fought as a joint medical entity. Not only joint U.S., but in fact, joint international. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that piece perhaps in, in a second. The second issue uh, was that within that joint uh, entity, we were going to concentrate on common shared uh, services um, and uh, the resources that all of the services need to tre create that commonality. So they all have a different mission, but there are clearly uh, some overlaps. We were going to leverage technology for the future so that we could deliver better care, faster care, um, at reduced cost uh, that uh, engaged the practitioners uh, in a more meaningful way. And when you look at military medicine, this was really important because we're a far-flung empire. Uh, we're worldwide. We've got people uh, practicing at camps, posts, and stations all over the world. And I mentioned before that in the new world of medicine, there's been increased penetrance of specialization. And so if you got a problem uh, on Guam, basically, how do you handle that? How do, how do you handle that? You can't have every specialist in the world on, on, on Guam, right? Uh, but, we, but America expects <coughs> that any service member anywhere in the world, if they're injured or ill, will get not just the standard of care, but above the standard of care. And that's something we've learned. That's the, the, the value system of, of the American public. So one of the strategies is to leverage technology. Um, we're in the process now of uh, building uh, basically uh, a robust telehealth capability that runs everywhere from uh, telebehavioral health, teleconsultation, teleICU. Um, uh, there are fantastic ways you can do teledermatology, uh, telecardiology, um, and you don't need every specialist at every camp, post, and station if you leverage uh, technology. One of the s signature improvements in the last 12 years of war in the military health system was our ability to uh, strategically evac uh, evacuate uh, <coughs> critically ill individuals thousands of miles take care of them at altitude, 37,000 feet, with, with, with all that implies relative to, relative to physiology, safely, expeditiously, with virtually no loss of life. And we're talking about individuals who have had two legs blown off, an arm blown off, shock lung, um, hemorrhagic shock, uh, who are being cared for in flight. So we know we can do it but it's about organizing, codifying it, uh, and delivering an integrated system. So we had to develop a joint system that leveraged technology. Uh, we had to, uh, in fact, uh, begin to invest in strategic partnerships. Uh, and this is where we understand we've got to renew our relationship with uh, the civilian community and academic uh, pillars of, of excellence. Uh, we have got to uh, also, uh, reform the benefit, um, just modernize the, the insurance program. Um, we've got to develop as one of our <coughs> core competencies uh, global health engagement uh, because uh, it turns out that's what we're doing already um, in an ad hoc way. Uh, we sail the comfort uh, to many places in the world um, and uh, we engage local populations. Uh, uh, with or without NGO partners, um, you know, we go to some place and we'll remove cataracts. It's like opening up a whole new world for, uh, for many populations. And this is diplomacy. Uh, it's a meaningful diplomacy. Um, as a principal uh, at the Department of Defense, I administer part of the uh, President's uh, uh, emergency <coughs> program for, for AIDS, the PEPFAR program, which has shown uh, amazing uh, uh, results. So we, we've got to engage in, in health diplomacy. And we've got to develop uh, uh, our leaders, um, uh, which is very, very important. Um, uh, even as we uh, modernize uh, our capabilities for the future um, and modernize our footprint. So those were the that's the world. Uh, those were the challenges, uh, and, and, and those are the lines of effort we're going to. That have. was terrific. That was 
incredibly helpful, both as background, but also laying out actually a lot of the issues where I was going to go and talking about uh, leadership. I, I want to ask one more question, uh, and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. So you made two point. I mean, you made a whole series of, of terrific points, but there were two that struck me um, as maybe something I'd like to explore a little more. Um, one is as you describe the budgetary future for the Pentagon, and if we leave things as status quo, the military health system continues to rise, the top line. It is, you know, we talk about healthcare cost problems for the U.S., um, and yet there's a sense that it's still theoretical. We don't see the trade-offs. You see the trade-offs very, very clearly, and I'm sure that all the senior leadership of the Pentagon sees those trade-offs very clearly. So the urgency and the importance of doing something <coughs> about this feels different and maybe more tangible here. And the second issue, and I think one of the things that came out of the Iraq War and, and, and Afghanistan, has been the, you know, we talk about the incredible advancement in military medicine in saving lives mm -hmm. and, and how um, safe and effective and sort of efficient the system has been at going into these very difficult places and, and taking care of people who are, are, are seriously ill. And so I guess my question for you is, Imagine it's three, four, five, ten. When, whenever you're out of this role, mm -hmm. and you're back in the civilian world. Let's say you know something I don't know. No, I'm just <laughs> asking. <laughs> at some point, <laughs> that's right. No, no. At some point, how do you begin to apply the lessons of this stuff to the broader healthcare system in the U.S.? Because in some ways, we don't feel the same tensions that you feel on a daily basis, and the life and death stuff that. I mean, actually, that has the same implications in, the, in a normal hospital, mm -hmm. but you don't see it as, as acutely and as obviously as you do when you're talking about a soldier in the, in the battlefield. And so it seems to me that the military has done a tremendous number of things that the civilian world could learn from. How do you begin to translate those lessons? Well, I, I, that's an excellent question, and I think um, what we have suffered from uh, predominantly within the medical um, uh, sphere of uh, interest is uh, a lack of really strategic uh, leadership, uh, which is we know we're we're trying to manipulate. Um, that's probably a bad word. We're, we're trying to influence a a number of stakeholders who see the world differently. You know, you can say on the one hand that you know uh, the costs of medical care are growing, and now it's 18 percent of GDP. Um, and on the one hand, you say, okay, so what? You know, it's producing goods and services, and you know, hey, it's adding jobs. You know, uh, health was one of the growth industries even during the height of uh, the, the, you know, the recession, depression, if you will. Uh, so, what is, what do you, what, what's the problem there? The, well, the problem is again this issue of it's a must-pay bill. So, uh, because we have this employer-based insurance uh, strategy, if you will, um, when those costs grow. Um, that depletes income to reinvest in business and to make other innova uh, innovations. And so it's a problem that everybody is dealing with. So the department is dealing with it. You know, personnel costs are, um, you know, consuming 33 percent of, uh, uh, of our cost uh, in the department. Um, <coughs> every company, every employer, every um, city government, um, state government has got to deal with it, uh, basically. The issue for us is to get a combined um, strategic uh, set of objectives uh, that resonates with all of the stakeholders so that you align everybody's effort to solve the problem. So I just said it's a problem for business it's, uh, in the private sector, state, uh, city government. You look at what happened in Detroit. Part of that is paying uh, um, health uh, health care costs. Uh, it's 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 a, a problem. But the issue is that everybody sees the solutions a little bit differently. So we need to develop a set of strategic leaders that can integrate the concerns and produce a commonality in the picture to begin to control uh, what essentially is the problem of, of costs, right? So uh, we've, we've got sort of a fix, um, uh, as collusive as it might seem, uh, to the insurance issue. Uh, but now the issue, the real work, is on controlling costs, yep. right? Um, and the truth of the matter is it, it's, every, it's good for everybody. But then how do you eat the elephant, right? It's about digging into the details of what are contributing to the costs 
understanding which stakeholders are going to see things differently. So, you know, the providers might see things differently in terms of controlling costs uh, versus uh, industry um, and manufacturers of certain equipment and the like. Uh, but I, the issue is that is if you dig into the individual sets of issues, there are going to be sweet spots in which you can get uh, groups of stakeholders to subscribe to a solution because it's for the common good. There will be trade-offs, but it requires uh, an incredible amount of uh, sustained uh, <coughs> leadership uh, with understanding what the end game is. And I think uh, to, ex to some extent we've not uh, define the end game. Now it turns out, let me just give one, one example and, and, and maybe stop there. It turns out that you really can align reduction in costs with improvement in access and improvement in quality. And let me just give you one example. Uh, um, over testing. Um, uh, it is not a marker necessarily of quality care. It actually leads to harm because it leads to invasive procedures that might uh, produce, and it's costly. The key is figuring out how you set up a set of uh, rules, guidelines, or, or regulations uh, to uh, make sure that uh, we define what the right amount of care is at the right time for the right person, which doesn't look like it's uh, so intrusive that it's uh, counter to uh, good medicine and having providers make independent decisions that are right for the individual patient. But, but there is a sweet spot on that. Uh, there, there is no doubt about that. Um, and the issue is that you can dissect out, I think, all of these different uh, um, problems and get them align to move us toward where, where we need to be. But it's going to be something that we're all going to have to deal with and it's not uh, unique to the military health system uh, at all. And it sounds like it's going to require real strategic leadership to, to find those commonalities. Um, so let's go ahead and see if there are questions from the audience. I have a whole list of other things I could go to but I, I want to make sure that people have a chance. So any questions for Dr. Whitson? Professor Blendon. Uh, Dr. Woodson, uh, Bob Lendon uh, from the school uh, was educating the faculty prior to this session and he had one point I was hoping he would go back to which is critical strategy for briefing the Secretary of Defense uh, on, on issues. I think many of us think you'd walk in that office a little bit differently and strategically he has some very effective ideas so I was hoping he'd just go back to them for a minute. Yeah, no, great, thanks, yeah. uh, great question and what we were talking about uh, um, uh, we were having a conversation and uh, I was mentioning that, you know, um, occasionally I have to go and brief uh, senior leaders uh, on, uh, uh, on issues and uh, Secretary of Defense um, uh, being one. And you have, um, it's very clear you have a finite time to get your message across because it's just like I said before, he's got to worry about what's going on in Syria, Afghanistan, and, and of course not having grown up in a background of health and health care, um, uh, terms and issues of foreign and context is lost. Uh, and so what you've got to do is make sure that you uh, move into that situation. Um, you're able to uh, concisely um, uh, uh, communicate the, the issue not the problem. I'll get to that in a second. Communicate the issue, okay, in language that he understands or any senior leader understands. And remember, again, this part of those that are north of me, they're basically lay people relative to health, okay? And they will think like lay people relative to health, not in the technical terms of a doctor. I cannot go in there and talk doctor talk, okay? <laughs> Uh, I've got to reinterpret the issue in terms of the political situation, the budget <coughs> situation, even as I drive uh, them toward my uh, selected course of action, which may include the technical solution that the folks below me uh, will, will understand, okay? So you have a finite amount of time, you've got to succinctly address the issue, uh, you've got to move into uh, the solution statement, not the problem statement. Senior leaders, when you operate um, um, at that level, um, can't go into their bosses with the problem. 
You can state the issue, but you've got to be ready to provide courses of action that drive to a solution. Uh, that, is, that is a fundamental difference than um, uh, what might happen um, in smaller organizations. Uh, uh, the, the, the senior strategic leaders uh, shouldn't be about necessarily problem solving. There are too many problems for this, them to solve. Their job is to understand the situation, uh, to integrate it into the broader political and maybe even budgetary or other situational concerns, uh, enable their people uh, to uh, effectuate the solution. Uh, one other thing I'll mention, because it may not be intuitive to a lot of folks, is that a lot of work uh, that is done um, in uh, upper levels of government, upper levels of the military, uh, are done by staff action. Um, and I don't know if you've had an opportunity to work as part of a staff or um, when you do staff analysis. That, that's something that is rigorously taught in the military. Uh, staff. Uh, uh, roles and function of staff analysis, uh, basically. Um, but um, the, the reason I'm bringing this up is because one of the issues you should, uh, at some point in your career, um, be able to, uh, to um, get experience with is how to work uh, within a staff, how to do staff analysis, uh, basically. And then when you become a senior leader, uh, you'll know the pitfalls of uh, staff interactions and staff analysis. Uh, um, I always say uh, to my folks uh, that when they come in to uh, brief me, I don't want the product so refined that I don't have some sense of granularity um, uh, as to uh, what the, some of the nuance issues are because um, it, it may be over refined. It may lead to the wrong choice or the wrong answer. And as a, as a leader, you've got to get to the um, place where you can um, uh, examine the staffing process and make sure it hasn't gone off the tracks, uh, basically. Um, that they haven't uh, misinterpreted um, uh, data or information leading you to the wrong uh, decision, particularly when you have to integrate a technical set of issues in the context of a political uh, or um, a more global set of concerns. Um, is that, that, that understandable? Uh, at some point in your, your careers, uh, you need to be involved with staff action so you know how that works, so that when you be, get, get to be a senior leader, uh, you, you know what the, uh, the vulnerabilities are of staff that doesn't work well. So I hand up there. No. Yes. <clears throat> Dr. Woodson, my name is Nang Nguyen, and I am an MPH student here at HSPH. Uh, I'm a Vietnamese American, and uh, I would like to ask you a question about international health mm -hmm. diplomacy. Um, I would like to hear your view on um, how and what U.S. have done to overcome a corruption problem in countries like Vietnam to get the people who really need things um, deserve or get the needs that they, they need. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you for that question, and that really is a great question. Um, and you brought up a couple of different uh, issues. Uh, uh, part of your question talked about uh, really relationship with other governments, um, and uh, the issue being that um, all governments may not be optimally functioning. Uh, let me just put it that way. Uh, uh, there are there's great uh, there are there are corrupt uh, regimes and there are just governments that are not functioning optimally for a lot of different reasons. Uh, we look at uh, global health engagement uh, really as another instrument of national power now. That um, it's a common language that is understood around the world that when done right. Uh, helps us build uh, entree into troubled regions, regions, helps us build capability and capacity in countries that actually uh, provide stabilization for societies um, and allows them to prosper and then build stable governments, if you will. Uh, it gets back to this issue again about how do you eat the elephant. You just, sometimes you just can't go in and say, you know, bad government, you reform, become more democratic, and they'll do it. That doesn't happen. 
you, you, you need to uh, uh, get an entree into a country, and health diplomacy is often that. If we can talk in terms of how do you improve the health of your population, how do you uh, uh, surveil for uh, disease outbreaks, how do you manage disease outbreak, how do you, do, how do you build a public health system uh, that serves your, um, your people well, um, uh, and how do you sometimes interpret that in terms of their own security concerns? So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, one of the reasons I think the Department of Defense uh, plays in this space and has been effective in this space is because oftentimes um, we can develop entrees in what we call military to military um, uh, interaction. But it turns out that in many countries, the only organized medical systems sometimes are in the military and that some of the population has to rely on the military system. So, for example, I just got back from Africa and one country I was uh, uh, visiting uh, where we have uh, many health engagement activities going on, one of them being PEPFAR. It was very clear to me that uh, the mill-to-mill -mill interaction um, uh, has produced uh, a cornerstone improvement in the entire healthcare system in this particular country. Uh, because now 80 percent of uh, the population that, um, let's just take AIDS, uh, is being seen in the military hospitals uh, where we began this military to, to, to military uh, engagement. So uh, it's important that uh, we try and define um, uh, uh, methods of engaging. Sometimes it's mill to mill. But more importantly, I, wanna, I wanna, want you to know that one of the actions that's taking place uh, uh, kind of across government, uh, uh, myself and several others in USAID, Health and Human Services, and state uh, and other agencies that have a portfolio that um, uh, include health, have been sitting down together and saying, how can we do this better? How can we engage better so that we understand what the end state is, what we really want to get uh, as uh, um, a, a product from our engagement in a country or a region? Um, and then who should play optimally within um, uh, that country, um, both in time and place? Um, so sometimes it's the military to military that has the entree. But at some point, it's time to hand it off to USAID or State Department or Health and Human Services or bring CDC in to help uh, develop a, um, a, a, an ongoing capacity uh, to uh, monitor for disease. Um, and how do we do that so that we keep the momentum going toward an optimal end state, which is building capability or capacity in that country that serves not only that country well, but that region well, and then um, the, the entire uh, uh, planet well, understanding that if there's an outbreak of, the, of a disease and you name the country and someone gets on a plane that eight hours later they could be here and we could have a pandemic, uh, basically. So can I ask, and you started answering this right at the end, um, but so I can see the tremendous value of, of this kind of engagement for the long run for building stable societies, which has uh, its own security benefits. Do you ever worry that this starts becoming mission creep in terms of what the military can and ought to be doing? Um, you can imagine at some point asking, should we be building health systems in other countries? Yeah. Is that really the core business of the military? Is, is that an issue you struggle with or no, think about? No, that's a, that's a great uh, question. Um, and that's exactly why I couched it in terms of uh, understanding what the end game is and what the warm hand does should be. Because the moment that the military um, uh, is no longer relevant or should not be the principal players, we need to get out. And we need to hand it off to State Department or USAID. Got it. That's very helpful. <coughs> Questions from, yes, sir. My name is Wai Ray. I'm a medical student here at Harvard School of Public Health. Sorry for the hat. It's really warm in here. But, um, but a question I have is in regards to bringing back your experience in the military to the to some of the civil challenges that we have in the healthcare field. Um, one of the huge problem that you know, we as medical students and public health students have run into is defining value, um, especially from a provider standpoint, because to an extent that could drive testing level, that could drive cost. From your encounter in the military setting, what have you 
ran into us some strategy or some ways of actually defining value of care and how it's compensated or how that's been regulated to to avoid costs skyrocketing? So uh, again, another very good question. Uh, embedded are, are several questions. Let me be transparent up front that one of the things that we don't uh, directly have to deal with uh, in the core military health system uh, is this issue of economic incentive for providers because largely they're paid the same, right? Um, now, that's only partially true, though, because you have to understand that 70% of the care that we pay for is actually in the private sector. So, yeah, 30% uh, core, but we still have to deal with those real-world factors uh, that are out there. And you brought up this concept of, of value, and this is why I think, you know, when we talk about strategic leadership, it's about um, how do we redefine, uh, reassign the incentives um, so that uh, uh, folks can, uh, uh, particularly for the investment they have in their careers in education, can feel prosperous in, in, in these career fields. Um, but at the same time, uh, not be incentivized uh, to overutilize, uh, overtest, um, and there are ways of uh, of doing that. Um, um, one of the things that we have to deal with, I think, is how we effectively um, array the workforce. Uh, so, if you take the whole entire group of uh, folks who uh, help deliver health care. Um, we need to evolve to a situation in which we develop uh, integrated teams um, and uh, we can deliver more effective care. We can offload, off burden some of the higher end uh, folks. Um, we can uh, make sure that they are um, uh, leaders of these integrated teams uh, appropriately compensated, but uh, not necessarily be in a situation where they're so overly competitive that they feel inclined to, in fact, uh, just overloot. So if we pay for a test or if we pay for a procedure, um, what you get is more tests and more procedures. If you incentivize outcome and then match that with an integrated team so that it's really about uh, the output of the team, um, you can disincentivize some of that overutilization. Ask you. Um, I think a lot of students who are sitting here are, are looking at your sort of uh, that really terrific description of leadership. The what it means to be a leader in, in a VUCA world. The the notions that a, that a leader is a translator, is an integrator, vision setting, enabling person. Um, but clearly, w watching you and describe the set of challenges you've been facing, you've had a lot of experience. This was not your first opportunity to to, um, to have a leadership position to sort of develop these things. What advice would you have for students who are here? Um, how do you begin? How do they begin to sort of develop some of those skills, get those experiences, um, so that they can take on bigger and 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 more complex roles in in their career? Uh, excellent question, um, and uh, I think it gets back to, I think, one of the uh, opening remarks, which is about building the toolkit. Um, uh, your, your toolkit um, comes from uh, certainly uh, formal cor courses and fellowships and schooling you, you may take, uh, but it comes uh, very often from the types of experiences you decide to immerse yourself in. Uh, one of the things over the course of my career, um, and I don't know that this was a conscious thing that I did, but I always gravitated to um, uh, difficult situations. Um, uh, organizations that were not particularly uh, the best. Um, problems that nobody else wanted to handle. Um, um, things that uh, people thought might be damaging actually to their careers, and I'll maybe give you a little example of that uh, in a minute. Uh, and I always found it fascinating uh, uh, to try and fix the problem, uh, to try and fix the problem. And so what I'm saying to you is that you've got to be willing to take a little bit of risk, live outside your comfort zone. Remember, feel comfortable living outside your comfort zone. 
um, and wade into um, issues um, where you think you can make a contribution uh, and uh, um, that's how you get the experience and you'll build your toolkit over time so that you can take on larger situations um, uh, be available for leading in uh, more difficult organizations or complex organizations one day you'll get tapped on the shoulder and the question is will you be ready uh, for that. Now let me just give you one uh, kind of example of what I'm talking about, uh, perhaps uh, briefly. Uh, uh, back in 2003, um, as we were heading to uh, the, the Operation Iraqi Freedom, the start of uh, the Iraq War, I was sitting in my office not too far from here interviewing uh, candidates for a residency and I got a call from the Pentagon and the conversation kind of went like this. Uh, uh, Colonel Woodson, um, there's an issue with a uh, hospital over in, uh, the, um, in uh, the theater, um, which is the term we use for where the action's gonna happen. Uh, uh, they need a change in leadership. Uh, your name came up, uh, pack your bags, you're getting ready to go, okay? Uh, I, I immediately got about Ten calls after that because it resonated all over, and people said, "You got to get out of that assignment. This is this is awful. You you just can't take this. This is going to be a career ender." Uh, basically, uh, I said, ah, "You know, what do I got to really lose?" And so I went over there, and it really was a kind of desperate situation where there was a combat support hospital that I was asked to take charge of. It was going to be really the first combat ho uh, support hospital at the uh, beginning of the war that was going to serve unknown casualties. But they had a real leadership problem. Uh, make a long story short, um, I ate the elephant, dissected out what was going on, made some changes, a couple changes in leadership, but it really was about uh, inspiring the individuals to give them a vision of where they wanted to be at the end of the war, how, what kind of pride they wanted to have having served at the end of the war, uh, putting in place some protocols and some technical things. This unit performed magnificently uh, and probably was one of the experiences that got me noted um, and eventually got me promoted to uh, general officer. So you gotta be willing to risk uh, something. So if I had to sum up some things for you to, to leave you with maybe three things uh, to, um, to think about as you develop your career. One is to build that toolkit. Second is to learn to live comfortably outside of your comfort zone and be willing to take on uh, those uh, experiences that other people won't take on. Uh, and the last thing uh, you need to do is to um, make sure that uh, you create a sense of balance in your lives um, uh, because you need to sustain your own personal momentum uh, and sense of energy. And you do this a number of different ways. Uh, um, one of the ways is really to uh, develop relationships uh, with mentors who, who can be your sounding board when, and, and tell you when you're going off the track. Uh, the caveat to that is to understand that uh, you need to achieve balance over life, but you may not be in balance in any one um, uh, time period. So when you're young uh, and if you're becoming a surgeon, you have to spend a lot of time pra practicing that craft. But you better find some time eventually for nurturing relationships and your family and the like because when you wake up at one point when you're 50 years old, uh, you're likely to have a severe middle life crisis <laughs> if you haven't. So thank you very much uh, with that. that. I appreciate that. That, that. that was that was terrific. And, and and you know, in some ways we talked about the military health system, but we really talked about was what leadership in action looks like and um, and what great public service looks like. So uh, thank you for the service to the country. Thank you for your vision of what is what is public service and leadership. Um, but I really think lessons that can be applied to all all parts of our lives. So so. Great appreciation for your coming in and, and taking the time to talk to us. I have one quick uh, public service announcement, which is next Tuesday. Um, the next seminar is uh, The Art of Leadership. It's going to be a conversation with Bill Strickland, who's the president and CEO of Manchester Bidwell, uh, a very innovative uh, organization that's been involved in arts and education. And I think that, too, will be a very a, a different but uh, a very insightful conversation. So tune in for that. 
Uh, but again, thank you very much for taking the time to do this. This was My great. My pleasure. Thank you.